Conversations, where Berkeley Hall goes deeper with people who make our world a better place, create change, and dare to be difference makers. I'm your host, Lisa Taylor. Our guest today has a passion for people and a passion for food, and doesn't ever want to see either one of them go to waste. So when he saw good food going to waste, people without jobs, and people going hungry, he created a solution and founded America's first community kitchen almost 30 years ago, which is not only a very successful program fighting food waste, joblessness, and hunger, it's a model for nonprofits that turns the charity model on its head from redeeming the giver to liberating the receiver. It's our great pleasure to welcome to the program the founder and president of LA Kitchen, Robert Egger. Robert Egger, nice to meet you. You too. And it's a pleasure to, to be here. Thanks. It's really nice to be here. Let's start at the beginning. Let's start sure. with what is LA Kitchen? What does it do? Wow. Well, I mean, it's it's like fifty things jammed into a beautiful box. Because you know, as you said in the in the very kind intro, um, I've never been satisfied doing just one thing. You know, oftentimes we think, hey, if I take food from here to there and give it to somebody, I'm fighting hunger. It's like, yeah, w well, you fed somebody, and that's cool, but. A job's really what's more important. So you get my point. I layer a lot of things in there. So, you know. So you're taking food from. Oh, here you go. Okay. Local places. Yep. Okay. So we'll start okay, with like the basics. Okay, here we go. You ready? The basics. Yeah. Um, every day in America, 40% of the food's thrown away. Half of it's 40%? fruits. 40%? 40 40%. It's staggering. Wow. Um, and half of that's fruits and vegetables. So by opening a kitchen here in Los Angeles, I have access to millions of pounds of beautiful free food that's donated, right? So donated food, and it comes from a restaurants, hotels, but primarily um, big uh, uh, wholesale businesses, grocery stores, and farmers directly, food they hate to throw away, again, fruits and vegetables, comes into our job training program. So what we offer is younger men and women who are aging out of foster care, who are often statistically on a very tough journey. Because, you know, we say in effect, okay, you're, you're, you're emancipated now, go off and do whatever you're gonna do, but you're not our responsibility anymore. And so often those men and women stumble, and oftentimes they're in prison. So that is, let's get those men and women before they end up there. But we also uh, offer men and women who are coming home after long journeys away a chance to come back. So I'm very interested, can an older person who maybe spent 10, 20, 30 years away help a younger person avoid that same trap, right? So free food comes in, men and women in a 15 week job training program learn culinary skills where they learn to chop, dice, puree, juice, zest, all the stuff we get. Now what's exciting is, usually a week or two in, now men and women know enough that when volunteers come, they can in turn teach volunteers. So by the second week, where people are still thinking, you know, how am I ever gonna really do this? Or I'm just an old felon, no one's gonna ever accept me. Suddenly here are students from a school like this coming to volunteer, and imagine the power of, of, of the joy of helping people learn to, to yeah. produce beautiful meals together. So. I think for many people who graduate, there's a sense of, I finished something, mm -hmm. you know? I graduated, my family's proud of me. I spent 15 weeks making beautiful food so that other people are fed. So we're trying to do is set people up so that they see that what they're learning can earn them an income, it can earn them respect, but it can also give them a sense of place in the world because they made the, their, the world better for somebody through the power of cooking. So how did you come up with the solution? You looked at these three problems, and you sat there in your in your room and you said, I have an idea, I'm going to create this. I mean, how did you come up with this brilliant solution, this model? Well, you know, it's funny, talking to the students today, I was trying to suggest that I had a very undisciplined mind as a kid. My mind wandered and, and I found great solace in the library where I could read books about, you know, scientists and adventurers and to my way of thinking, I, you know, it was very difficult for me to learn math, for example, out of a book. Analytical learning was very difficult. But, you know, through art and, and music, I came alive. So when you study art and music and even cooking, you start to see how things can come together in ways that you normally, most people wouldn't see it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look, like the first time I remember as a kid seeing Picasso, and this idea of that's a bull, that's a woman, that's, that's you know, and this idea of like there's other ways to see things. Yeah. That spoke to me. So I've been one of those people who could always kind of put things together that others didn't see. So it's funny because people have still to this day, 30 years later, somewhat marveled at this contraption, yet I see it as a very elemental, pretty basic thing. In other words, it's taken food our society throws away. People our society undervalues. Again, homeless, addicts, prison, men from prison. Um, a kitchen, 
that's sitting there empty oftentimes. And just so you know, I've helped about 100 and some odd cities develop kitchens and started another program called Campus Kitchens, which says, look, there's 60,000 school cafeterias in America that are closed all the afternoon, use them. So the idea of kitchens that are unutilized, um, chefs who had jobs but would also help teach. So I, I tend to be, you know, it's like when you have a chef come over to your house and you're like, oh, I'm so embarrassed, I have nothing in the refrigerator. And they're like, oh, well, wait a second. And they, 15 minutes later, they serve you something. You're like, how like, did, how did you, do you do that? that? Yeah. That's what I do, only I do it with cities or communities and so say, in fact, look at what's here. So what are you looking for? When you look at a city, what are you looking for that are the elements that you're pulling together? What What is it that you see that we're not seeing? Well, A, I always look down. Uh, to see what's kind of metaphorically right at your feet. Yeah. You know, the gold, if you will, that's right there. So, again, now this didn't, you know, it was, as I told the student today when they asked, what was that moment for you? It was a volunteer experience where I was serving people outside in the rain from the warmth of a truck. So I, I, I experienced charity, which I get it, it's time honored, but as I said, it's more about the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. And I kept thinking, I'm the one getting the better end of this deal. I get to go home feeling good about myself at the expense of somebody who was outside on the street. So that made me think about the person there, the empathy, if you will. Right. But also, I came up in an era in the 60s in which I saw people who took action against injustice. You know, So when I was a kid living here in Los Angeles, you know, I saw Cesar Chavez. You know, I saw Robert Kennedy, I saw Dr. King, I saw, you know, Gloria Steinem. I saw so many people taking a stand for who they were or who other people were in that sense of this isn't right. So I felt as a young kid, the same age as the students we talk to today, I was I was a witness to some real incredible people and there was a sense of I wanna be part of that. You know, I wanna be part of that movement. So what I've I think I've done is taken a wanderer's heart um, with an empathetic soul but with a social justice warrior spirit and put them all together. Wow, that's a great statement. I never so there, said that before. The, that's pretty good. That's Did you remind cool. me of that? Yeah, you know? that's very cool. So you, you've said that a good solution to a problem always lifts everyone up and allows everyone to be part of the solution. And, and the way you're describing the kitchen, it's really doing that. It's really following that model. So, so how are you how are you lifting up the people when they aren't necessarily going in the same direction that you want them to go or they're pulling in it they're not feeling good about themselves or what are you doing to help them feel like they can be right part of the solution well a everybody who walks through our doors is there looking for something so whether it's a chef president of the united states you know Somebody who just got from prison here, many kitchen, times. Right? Yeah, the Clintons came in, the Obamas came in. Um, they're looking for something, right? So, a, I tend to view everybody who comes in who is is, in, is there's a deeper hunger in America. You know, there's the, the the physical hunger of being without food, but there's also that spiritual hunger of longing to belong, to be part of something, to contribute, to have meaning, and that's what interests me. So, a, on the very first day of most classes, I'll say to the students. You know, look, it's going to be a hard 15 weeks. You know, I, I won't kid you around, and some of you won't make it. But today, on your very first day, there's an older person in this town that's going to get a decent meal because of you. You know, and I think many of the students come in thinking this is going to be school, and they're mm -hmm. almost waiting for the moment to say, "How tick tick tick? When can I drop out?" Right. And I think for for that kind of curveball to be like, "What do you mean somebody's going to get a decent meal because of me today?" And what they find very quickly is. That becomes what makes people excited about coming to, to the school is, is they're taking care of someone else. They're learning, but somebody's getting a decent meal every day. And so that idea that while they're learning a skill, someone else is benefiting is kind of the duality of what we try and do. But at the same time, I mentioned we have volunteers quite a bit, and volunteers learn from the students. So in effect, I remind myself that when I went out that first time to volunteer to serve the poor, I was burdened by ignorant bigotries and stereotypes about who I'd encounter. We all have stereotypes and we all have bigotry. So that idea of realizing that many people are gonna be coming in thinking, oh my God, you know, this place works with felons and addicts and you know, this is gonna be really weird. I, I remember the way I felt. So when people come in, I want them to come in and feel comfortable very quickly. So it's very clean, it's very organized and everyone's in uniform, so there's a great sense of order. Yeah. But I, I want people to, in effect, everyone when they leave, to feel like, wow, this made me 
a better person today because I made somebody else a, a, a decent meal. You were you were mentioning that spiritual hunger. You know, the hunger in America isn't just or, or around the world. It's not necessarily the food hunger. There's a right. deeper hunger going on. And the, the spiritual hunger that you're feeding of being of service to someone else, that, that taking that unselfed position of I'm now helping right. someone else. I'm teaching the volunteers who come in. I'm, you know, giving a meal to someone who didn't have a meal. Has, has that been the overarching sort of driving force yes. behind the LA Kitchen? Yes. I, I realized very early on that hunger was so much bigger than I imagined. I mean, I didn't know who was hungry in America. I mean, yeah, sure, I had some basic idea. There were poor people in America and homeless people, but I had no idea of the depth of it, right? Mm -hmm. So very quickly I realized, wow, I can't fix that. But... If I can reveal the community's ability through working side by side to address the issue, that's the real thing I'm after. You know, sometimes people in my business can get a little bit carried away with the idea if, they, if I just get more money or build a bigger kitchen, I can feed more people. And that's cool, yes, but that's not going to solve a problem. What is it that solves the problem? Well, empathy to a certain, or empathy in action. You know, the more people, in fact, we have a process we call, and this is our little secret, I'm giving it away here, but we call the calculated epiphany. That when people come in to volunteer, I want them to leave thinking new ideas. I always say, look, we're not in the nonprofit business. We're not in the hunger business. We're in the bravery business. Mm -hmm. You know, it's our job to make people, whether they're addicts, felons, or presidents or anybody, brave enough to trust another human, to, to listen, to, to want to know more about someone else, um, to, to, to risk a little bit of their sense of comfort, to leave that comfort zone. We all covet. You know, most people in America are really cool and nice, but if you say, let's talk about race, let's talk about, um, you know, uh, sexism, let's talk about a million different things, most people are like, oh, I, I don't want to. Yeah. But we have to. It makes us uncomfortable, right. and those are the areas that we need to delve right. into. So what right. I try and do is just set up an environment where people can, before they realize it, be in a conversation they never thought, with somebody they might not have ever voluntarily said, yeah, I'll sit there with a bunch of felons with knives and have a great conversation. <laughs> you know, but here you are suddenly, and you're working together and you're talking and the next thing you know that you have this sense of like wow this is so much better than i thought it would be you know i can i could do this again and yeah. that's that's the doorway the calculated yeah man thing. james brown once said i don't want nobody to give me nothing open the door i'll get it myself all i do is open the door that's all my job is to open the door and make people brave enough to go through the thing is you, you're seeing the doors i mean there are, there are a lot of people who don't see the door so how do we teach young people how to see the door and well, it's, help others. it's one of the reasons I, I came here today. Now, you know, to a certain extent, there might be people on our board who are like, well, what are you doing talking to a bunch of kids today? Go out there and make some money, you know? And there might be people who think, oh, man, kids today, they're all in their iPhones. But the reality is, I look at that audience that we just talked to and realize those are our future leaders. These are kids who are going to, in a million different ways, change the world. And if I can give them one little sense of, you can do this. You know, one of the things I love, it's, a, it's kind of a weird thing, but sometimes when you're talking to young people, uh, and particularly really, you know, fifth grade and below, I'll start talking about Harriet Tubman. Now, I love Harriet Tubman, right? But I'll ask, is there anybody in this room who's about four foot eight and weighs about 95 pounds? And, you know, inevitably, a, a, a modest young, younger woman will raise her hand. It's like, come up for a second. That's how big Harriet Tubman was, you know? And you think about this image we have of Harriet Tubman. 19 times she went down to the deep south. Danger every single yeah, moment. Larger than life. Moment, yeah, but she was, this is how big she was. So size has nothing to do with bravery, ability, you know, the idea that you can make a difference in the world. So don't ever think you're too small, you're too anything. Anybody can make a difference. So what is it that you have to be brave about? You mean me personally or us no, in general? No, I mean, when you, when you say, you know, we're helping people be more brave in their, in their pursuit of making a difference. Well, think about it. it. I mean, most men and women who are out of prison, their entire life has been what they did, you know, mm -hmm. their past or their number. And that idea of helping people to be brave enough to see beyond that. Now, you know, what's really hard to, for a lot of people to comprehend, but there's a lot of people who don't feel like they're worthy of love or success. Well, there's so many. I mean, it, yeah. you don't have to just have a hard background to feel that way. Right. I think right. most people at right. some point or another probably feel Well, this is unworthy. why years ago, years ago, the, the idea that the kitchen was just about the, the men and women who were in the program. No, it's about everybody. That, that The idea became, I wanted to build a bigger kitchen, not for the vainglorious pursuit of scale or more food, which is cool. We can do that. But it's like, I can bring more people in. Because I realized that that, that to your point, everybody. Remember, again, man, the first time I saw 
um, uh, the movie Yellow Submarine, and and the the beautiful, still to my to my eyes, really one of the great early music videos was um, Eleanor Rigby, you know, and that refrain, "Look at all the lonely people." When I was sixth, seventh grade, eighth grade, and you're wrapped up in the passion of youth, though that refrain really struck with me. Look at all the lonely people. And so a lot of my work has been, how can you find a way for those lonely people to find other lonely people so they can, that's not necessarily be lonely together, but they can find common cause and do something. And there's a, there's a, there's a point on your website where you talk about everyone having an important role in the community and everyone having their place and feeling that sense of purpose right. and depth. How do we instill that in young people? One of the easiest metaphors for people to get, it's the, it's the idea of don't but judge a book by its cover. Well, it's like don't judge a, a head of lettuce by its outer leaves. So like I was able to do with kindergartners today, you know, to hold up a piece of lettuce and say, would you eat this? And have the kids go, ooh, but then say, well, now stop for a second. Let's just take these leaves that don't look so good out. Look at four leaves and look at how much is left. And it's an easy way for them to understand the concept of don't throw away food because it's ugly. But then it's a very simple jump. And frankly, many of them will see it without me having to say it out loud. People are the same way. Mm -hmm. you know. So whether it's an older person who has wrinkles uh, or whether it's somebody who's out on the, homeless on the street, it, it helps people realize that inside there, there's still something beautiful. And it just takes sometimes the, the, uh, the, the fellow human, the, the chef or whatever to, 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 sh to reveal that. Do you have a personal practice that keeps you centered and balanced and sort of keeps you on that path of being able to see the value in everyone and not getting frustrated with the process along the way? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm a, I'm a flawed human like everybody. I mean, I, I, I wake up mad, frustrated. I, get, I can be really cantankerous about people who I don't agree with, but I try really hard to remind myself constantly. Now, it sounds goofy, and I know this isn't for every audience, but I have this heart tattooed oh. here so when I'm tempted to use this finger <laughs> I'm reminded you know put it away don't be a judgmental person most people aren't bad or stupid they're afraid again I talk about the bravery business so oftentimes it's easy to judge somebody because they're afraid versus being empathetic and realize I might not agree with their opinion but they're probably making it because they're just afraid of the new idea so cool I get that now I have to work really hard you know I become frustrating trying to find a way to get you to see the idea but I understand you're not a bad person that's one of my first things but it sounds goofy but years ago I was um, traveling and I saw a little cement a heart in cement humans have this weird thing they'll either write their initials or a heart when they see wet cement and so I took a picture of it and sent it on to my wife saying love on the road thank you and the next day, I saw another. And almost every single day since then, I found a heart. And it's become this thing I do called Love on the Road. Oh, wow. And virtually every day, I'll post a picture of somewhere. And if you get my point, it's a fun thing to do, but it's it's a way in everyday life to realize it's all, they're there, it's everywhere you look. It's just keeping your eyes open for it. Right. So everything that they taught me in school, in church, in civics, led me to this sense of, of this is a manifestation of love. That if you love your family, you work to make the world a better place. If you love your country, you work hard to make your country a more just place. So I would I would caution that love isn't kind of that dopey sense of like, you know, this. It's sometimes that sense of I will go out and I will I will do I will take risks. Sometimes I will risk it all for that bigger thing because I love my family, I love my country, I love this world too much to sit idly by. Yeah, I so, love it enough to take a stand and do it fearlessly yeah. and with strength and right. in the face of all odds. So so when you face challenges doing the kitchen and you had people saying no at every turn. They still do. They still do. They so still how do. do you overcome that? What is it what is it that rises up inside of you that says I'm going to go I'm going to push through this? Well, I study history. You know, as, again, as I said, as a, as a kid, I, I struggle with learning and paying attention to school. But as a, as an, I've really embraced fully lifelong learning. So I read a lot, and I love history because I'll give you an example. Um, I'm mesmerized by the history of the women's movement. So in 1848, a group of women got together and had the first the Seneca Falls Conference, which was the first step towards the idea of women achieving the right to vote. But it took 72 years of work, and those 72 years. That's a long time. 
you know, to pursue something that's so obvious today. But so sometimes when you read through history, you realize that, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And that sometimes you have to be first and first. Now, another thing that's important to acknowledge is, dude, I'm a, I'm a white man in America. You know, I was given huge gifts and huge doorways, the least of which was self-confidence. Um, and, I, you know, again, to my way of thinking, it's my job to use those gifts. To a certain extent, I'm a Trojan horse because I can get further in the gates than other people could. So oftentimes I might be a white dude on the outside, but I'm Malcolm X under the skin. I am Sojourner Truth. You know, I am Cesar Chavez. I am, you know, uh, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. You know, there's all these people that I internalized because as a kid, I became so enamored of these stories of America. Tell me, tell me a story of, of someone who's been in your kitchen who was afraid, and, and what did you do to give them courage? Oh, well, every day. I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I do use that. There's a woman who I work with now, and there's been a woman in D.C. who I work with, that I often used to call our Harriet Tubman because she didn't see herself that way. But the point is, you're one of our very first graduates, and you're an employee here now, and you're going to be the leader. You know, thousands of people, volunteers, students will follow you. You are now a liberator. And that sense of like, you know, I'm just a cook here. You know, I'm, I'm barely just graduated. And you're, you're, now you can make a case that I'm putting too much on that person. But the point is, I know how strong she is. Uh, but I've seen so many people struggle with that sense of, of identity and, and that sense of what they can be. I'm sure at this school, people come back and they're like, look, I'm, I'm 40 now, but what I learned here at this school still serves me to this day, which is one of the reasons I was so honored to be, you know, today I'm that guy. I'm that guy that somebody 20 years from now might remember. There was this guy who came to our school, you know, and he taught me about, he, I remember him peeling lettuce leaves off and that changed my way of thinking and now I'm doing something on something. Is there someone in your past who played that role for you? I mean, there's so, so many, many But pick people. one, tell us one. You know, I had, I had a, a baseball coach once and it sounds goofy, but um, I had this coach who, um, in the middle of the game, timeout, timeout, timeout. Mr. Ortiz is playing third base, and he walks out, and I'm, he's like, I'm like, why are you coming to me? What did I do? What did I do? And he's like, son, son, come here, come here. And he walks over, and he leans in, and he goes, what are you going to do if the ball comes to you? And I'm like, well, you know, catch it. And he's like, son, no, look, you got somebody on first, you got somebody on second, you're on third. You have the makings of a triple play. If you're working as a team, you can get the ball tagged third, get the second, you got a triple play, but if that person's thinking, it gets the first. So I'm like, wow, okay, coach, cool. So I'm sitting there. And lo and behold, bap, boop, 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 triple play. And I'm leaving the field and everybody's patting me on the back. And the coach looked at me and said, son, always be prepared when the ball comes to you. Now, that really changed my life because what you realize is there's a difference between waiting for the ball to come to you and, and making a triple play versus wanting the ball and actually go out looking for the ball. You know, And that changed my life because it made me realize you can make things happen. Why wait? You know, so for example, I came here to Los Angeles because there's going to be a real issue with aging in America. You know, millions of people are going to get old. Now I can wait for this metaphorical silver tsunami to crest, or I can, to a certain extent, swim out and surf. Run towards it. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, what that coach taught me is run towards the ball. Don't run away from it. Never be, you know, but be prepared, but run towards it. And have and, a plan. And have a plan. Exactly. Yeah. But but don't shy away from the opportunity to make it a triple play in life. No matter how scared you are. Were you scared as that third baseman? I'm still scared. <laughs> but the point is, I'm, I'm more, I'm, I'm scared, which again, it's important in life to stay scared. But at the same time, you know, I, I know the power of what can happen if you get past that fear. Like Fear the Fear and Do It Anyway, yeah. that famous book. Yeah, what do I have yeah. to lose, you know? What have you have to lose? And and so much to gain. And overcoming fear is part of life. Right. And, and see, I'm at a place now where I'm a leader, you know, whether it's <laughs> deserved or not. But the point is people follow me. So as a leader, sometimes I have to lead by example. And to me, you know, showing that you persevere, you push through. Even when things are, are so stacked against you, you still get up and you walk towards the issue not run from it. And so if I can help influence, whether it's a student in our program, whether it's a volunteer, whether it's a president, you know, the idea is here's the power of what we can do if we walk towards the problem, but we walk towards it together. Robert Egger, it's such a pleasure yeah, well, to meet you. Thank you good. so much. It's a pleasure to be and here. And thank you for joining us on Conversations. We'll see you next time.